Hello and welcome to today's iCentd Connect meeting. I'm Marianne Comparet and I'm speaking from the International Society for Neglected Tropical Diseases. Um, hello to everyone. I've seen a lot of familiar names on the attendees list. So um, to those I know personally, a very warm welcome and a big hello. Lovely to have this opportunity to connect with you and to everybody else who is new to the series, uh, also a very warm welcome. Um, here at iCentd, we're trying to meet up about a couple times a week uh, to discuss all sorts of topics in and around neglected tropical diseases from rabies to molecular diagnostics, um, hand washing, etc. So today we've got a really fantastic turnout for today's topic. Um, in fact, I'm speaking from London where it's been raining really heavily, so even the snails are out in great numbers uh, for today's topic, which is schistosomiasis. And uh, my, it's our greatest pleasure today to have the opportunity to welcome uh, Derek Asakunor. Uh, Derek is here today. You are going to talk to us a little bit more about some of the treatment gaps that remain uh, in the fight to control and eliminate schistosomiasis. You're completing your PhD um, with the um, with the Parasite Immunoepidemiology Group at the University of Edinburgh. And you're also speaking today on behalf of the Global Schistosomiasis Alliance. Um, so both groups doing incredible um, multidisciplinary work across a huge amount, bringing a huge amount of partners together. So it's going to be a real pleasure to hearing more uh, and an update from those both those groups. So thank you, Derek, and over to you. Great, thank you, Marion, for the splendid introduction. Um, so I'll be speaking to, to you today on current perspectives regarding schistosomiasis treatment gaps that are hindering our global elimination efforts. Now, in your, in your shot is a beautiful scenery from Bukoto in Uganda. Women washing, some children playing in basins of water, others playing on the side, and men fishing. Now to these people, these are their daily routine activities. However, they stand a chance of getting infected with parasitic worms called schistosomes that cause the disease schistosomiasis. Enough contact with water will enable penetration of these parasitic worms into the skin and then begins the life cycle of the parasite. So on your screen is the complete life cycle of the parasite to your right where you see the little human is where upon, upon contact with infected water, when the parasitic worms penetrate the skin, these migrate to the liver where they mature into male and female adults. And then later pair as male and female where they migrate to blood vessels that are close to either the intestine or the bladder, depending on the species, where they lay thousands and thousands of eggs. Now, at this point, the anti helminthic of choice, prasequantel, is effective at treating all the adult worms. And also the eggs that are laid usually cut through the epithelial lining of the intestine or the bladder in attempts to enter the intestine or the bladder to be excreted via the feces or the urine. And so at this point also, these can be tapped as diagnostics where we detect eggs in the stool or the urine via microscopy. Now, when these eggs are laid and come into direct contact with, uh, with freshwater bodies or are washed and carried away by rains into freshwater bodies, they mature, they hatch and penetrate a snail intermediate host where a sexual reproduction goes on to produce more of the infective forms into freshwater that penetrate the human skin to continue the life cycle. Now, on your screen, you see the two red crosses. These are points where vital interventions can be implemented in order to break transmission and prevent infection, i.e. snail control, because the intermediate snail host is essential for transmission of the infection. There's no human-to-human -human, uh, direct infection. And also preventing direct contact with infective water. And so schistosomiasis is essentially a neglected tropical disease. It's also subtropical, as is common in parts of South America and um, Asia. 
it's usually common in communities with poor water and adequate sanitation provision. It's also called bilhazia in common terms. I'm sure most of you would have heard that. It's named after the German pathologist who discovered it back in the 1850s. Now, as mentioned earlier, schistosomiasis is caused by schistosomes or blood flukes. Over 250 million people worldwide are infected. And as you see on the map, in the green areas, more than 90% of cases occur in sub-Saharan Africa. There are two main forms, the intestinal and urogenital forms, of which the urogenital forms form a majority of the disease. Now, before I run you through the perspectives I'll be talking to you about, um, I'd like to mention that this idea um, came about as a result of the ECTMIH meeting back in Liverpool in 2019, where a panel of experts held excited discussions regarding schistosomiasis control throughout the ages. It was organized by the GSA again, and this has birthed a wonderful opinion piece that has been accepted in trends in prastology. So please do look out for it and have a read. Now, schistosomiasis is a vicious disease. It causes debilitating consequences throughout life. As you can see from the pictures on your screen, um, in infants and preschool children, it causes abdominal distension from organ involvement. There's malnutrition. And then at the school age, there's poor cognition in school and reduced physical activity. In adults, it can cause very poor sexual and reproductive health, as well as susceptibility to co-infections due to the lesions it can leave on the skin. And in old age, it can cause various organ-related cancers and even death in very severe cases. Now, in endemic areas, the intensity of infection, which is usually measured by the amount of eggs that are excreted via the stool or the urine, is usually highest between people of ages 5 to about 19. And so the main strategy for preventing schistosomiasis is preventive chemotherapy, usually through mass drug administration and monitoring in endemic areas. This is usually uh, done in most parts of sub-Saharan Africa. There's currently no vaccine for the disease, and the Pazequantel for treatment has no pediatric formulation as of yet. Now, mass drug administration depends on endemicity of the disease as confined to a specific area. And so treatment can be either once a year, twice a year, or twice throughout the entire school year of children. This is made possible by donated Pazequantel for MEC, and they donate about 250 million tablets per year. But unfortunately, this is only enough to treat about 100 million school children. And so there's a huge, huge supply gap in there that needs to be filled. The map on your right is showing you, if you look at the brown areas, um, as at 2018, the status of schistosome endemic countries worldwide. And as you see from lots of the brown areas, most countries still require preventive chemotherapy, showing that there's still much more to be done with regards to the disease. So what are some of the elimination efforts that have happened till date? I'll walk you through the WHO NTD roadmap um, regarding neglected tropical diseases. Now, the first one was published in 2012 uh, for a group of NTDs of which schistosomiasis was a part. And the targets was that by 2020, we reduce the morbidity associated with the disease and to eliminate the disease as a public health problem by 2025. Fast forward, the current version of the document has just been uploaded by the WHO. And if you look at the heat map to your right, it still shows that for all the areas that need evaluation for elimination of the disease, schistosomiasis still needs critical action. Now, could this be due to essential treatment gaps or even other methods of control? As I've mentioned that treatment is the main strategy for prevention and control, I'm going to walk you through the various treatment gaps that I believe are resulting in some of the patterns that we are seeing as per this roadmap. Now, if you look at the image to your right, 
um, I show you the various different strategies for MDA in endemic countries. And the first thing that needs mentioning is the fact that the endemicity that determines the frequency of treatment is based solely on school age children only. And so this may not necessarily prevent, present an adequate um, picture of how frequent or um, how serious the disease is and how frequent treatment should be. Now, the first strategy is school-based MDA, where children between five to, um, five to 15 years are treated. This excludes preschooler children less than five and excludes adults above 15 years old. The other strategy implemented, which is slightly less common, is the community-based MDA. And this now, in addition to school age children, includes adults 15 years and above. The only way to be able to include everybody in the bracket is, as I mentioned earlier, if we have a pediatric prosequential formulation in addition to community-based MDA, then we can include everybody in the bracket. So there's exclusion of infants and preschool age children and some adults in most endemic areas. Now, I'll give you a picture of the current situation. This, the, the maps you see, B and C, are uh, generated from data from the prevent, Preventive Chemotherapy Database of the WHO. Now, as of 2018, globally, 290 million people required preventive chemotherapy, but only about 97 million people received treatment. For school age children, as you see for image B, the target was 75%, but only 70% of them were reached. For adults, it was worse. Only 13% of adults were reached. And it's worth noting that if you look to your far right, countries like Mozambique that had um, the highest prevalence of infection amongst adults did not have any treatment programs for adults. And so next, after highlighting these gaps, I'm going to walk you through what the gaps are specifically for preschool children and for adults, as well as give you what the current perspectives for treatment are. So for preschool children, as at 2010, the WHO issued a directive to include this age group in treatment strategies, of which work from my lab contributed a great deal. However, if you go to most endemic areas, these this age group are still excluded from treatment. And some of the reasons that have been attributed include the lack of a child-friendly formulation of the Pasquantel, uh, lack of a consensus on dosing and safety of the current tablet. And again, preschool children are not in school. So if you have a school-based MDA, they are not available to be reached for treatment in the first place. There's also poor understanding of risk, infection, and um, disease treatment dynamics. And then finally, there are operational challenges. Imagine having to get a stool or urine sample from a six-month-old baby or an eight-month-old baby. It can be very, very challenging. Now, some of the consequences resulting from this exclusion is, first, most importantly, there's a huge health inequity there. This age group cannot be excluded from treatment if they do get infected. So long as they remain untreated, they remain reservoirs for transmission of the infection. And if they have to have all this infection until about age five or six when they receive their first treatment, that means a longer lasting infection, heavier bedding, and causing more debilitating consequences in this age group. So what is the current evidence regarding this age group and schistosomiasis? The work from my lab has shown that this age group can develop infection as well as clinical disease in as quickly as three months from exposure. And you can detect this using the currently available field tools. You don't need anything special. Now, Kulibali and colleagues have also shown that when the current treat treat treatment tablets are crushed and administered alongside with juice or bread, it's effective at treating infection at the standard dose. The current treatment also based on a lot of work from my lab has shown that it can reverse the morbidity seen in these kids. And even chronic morbid morbidity such as stunting can be reversed with repetitive treatment before the school age. It's worth mentioning, however, that reinfections are possible after treatment. But 
again, a lot of work from my lab has shown that when you treat preschooler children just as seen in adults, it can induce parasite specific immune responses that are associated with reduced reinfection rates. So there's still a lot to gain from that. So what are the opportunities for interventions based on the evidence that I've just stated? The first one, which is the game changer, is the pediatric pazoquantel tablet. Now, this is currently being done by the pediatric pazoquantel consortium. Um, it's made up of the teams that I've shown you to your left with all the logos there. Um, now, the advantage of the current tablet is that it's just about a quarter of the, the current tablet. It is not bitter. It can dissolve easily on the tongue and so it makes it easy for infants and young children to take with or without water. Now, this is currently undergoing phase three trials, um, but unfortunately, due to COVID-19, WHO has issued directives for MDAs and large community service to come to a halt, and so this has been affected. Um, we're hoping that this, this will be able to resume as soon as possible. Now, pending this, preschooler children can still be treated on a case-by-case -case basis using the existing tools that are available for all the other age groups. With regards to the access problem, this age group can be accessed through health centers and child health days. Um, an example is what our group does in Zimbabwe. We utilize the health centers to reach these kids for treatment. And in Uganda, the routine albendazole treatments are administered via child health days. If treatment of preschooler children is to be included in MDAs, then we need to be able to estimate what the exact burden of infection is in this age group and also identify what the focal areas are in order to reach treatment. And then finally, we need to include them in monitoring and evaluation programs in order to know the exact progress of control and preventive measures as we go along. Now, with regards to adults, um, this age group is eligible for treatment. However, the problem with this age group is that there's significantly low coverage due to certain barriers that are preventing the uptake of prosequantil. Now, some of it include the fact that prosequantil is donated and there's barely enough for school age children. The other is that there are several wrong community perceptions when you go to endemic areas, and these include the fact that it's an STD, it's a children's disease. If you report your, your symptoms, you can be stigmatized. Others are also too busy to take time off work in order to attend MDA strategies. Some of the symptoms that it causes in adults can be non-specific, especially in endemic areas where we have several other co-infections and comorbidities uh, presenting itself. And in pregnant women, health workers are lacking the support to treat um, schistosomiasis in pregnancy, despite the WHO recommendation. Um, this is usually due to the fact that you don't find these um, safety profiles on the theory sheets that come along with the tablet. Now, some of the consequences in adults, uh, similarly, like I mentioned in the preschool children, um, these can be specific. For females, it can include postcoital bleeding, genital itch, genital discharge. It can even cause ectopic pregnancy and maternal death. In males, there are enlarged genital organs where they can even get fibrous and cancerous. Um, the geni there's genital and ejaculatory pain, um, as well as abnormal ejaculate. And in both sexes, all of these can lead to infertility, susceptibility to HIV and other STDs due to the lesions it can leave around the genital area. And then there can be bladder cancer and portal hypertension. So likewise, what are some of the evidences that have been pre presented in this age group and the opportunities that it presents for intervention in adults? The first is that for both sexes, Pazoquantel can reverse all the urogenital symptoms that come along with the disease. The second is that in females, Pazoquantel is safe and effective in pregnancy and lactation. For pregnant women or 
should I say for females, it's been shown that they spend 25% and 60% of their reproductive life in pregnancy and lactation alone. So for this age group, the opportunities for intervention based on some of the problems I've stated will include the fact that we need to train and include community drug distributors. If there are certain problems that are preventing the uptake, we need to be able to reach out to these adults by improving our dissemination strategies. We also need to educate people in an endemic areas to dispel some of the myths and perceptions regarding cystosomiasis. Again, when you keep un undertaking MDA, there's a likelihood for treatment fatigue. And so another strategy that has been proposed is the fact that we can use the test and treat, treat method in order to treat those who need it. Um, the indirect advantage will also be that we can have enough pasoquantal tablets to be able to treat the adults who really need it. And then if we have a lot of the farmers listening, we need to increase the donations of pasoquantal in order to be able to reach all the age groups and expand treatment. And then finally, most endemic areas must move from the school-based MDA to the community-based MDA where it includes a wider bracket to include adults as well. And so with all the opportunities and evidence that I've shown you in expanding and improve, improving treatment coverage, the question remains, can treatment alone realize elimination targets? The answer is no. If cystosomiasis is associated with poor sanitation, poor water supply, then improving water sanitation and hygiene, which is usually abbreviated as washed, will prevent certain human behavior that are linked to infection risk to schistosomiasis. Now, we also need to improve on our health and education. And one of the main targets um, as per the new WHO directive due to COVID and the fact that we cannot implement MDAs is the fact that we now need to target education and get people to dispel myths and improve um, the risk that is associated with disease. And as I mentioned, the snail, the intermediate snail host is required to produce the infected forms that penetrate the skin. And so improved snail control will break transmission and prevent people from getting infected. I'll show you a brief video that puts everything in perspective, everything that I've spoken about in perspective. Hundreds of thousands of children and adults in sub-Saharan Africa face a daily risk of catching a devastating waterborne and parasitic disease. Schistosomiasis causes debilitating symptoms, holding back many children from reaching their full potential. For the past 10 years, Merck has been helping the fight against schistosomiasis by donating more than 500 million praziquantel tablets to the World Health Organization for African countries. Thanks to this partnership, more than 100 million children have been treated to date. However, Regular treatment alone is not enough to stop schistosomiasis. Water, sanitation and hygiene, alongside vector control and education, are also important. While much has already been done, more improvements are needed. These improvements are being driven by a strong global health community who unite around one goal, a future free from schistosomiasis. Elimination is possible. Join us in making history. Before I sign off, um, I'll leave you with a couple of take home points. And these are that exposure and infection with schistosomes begin from birth and can occur at any age. It comes with devastating consequences that can persist throughout life. Consequential treatment is safe and effective across all ages, and treatment gaps create serious health inequities. And finally, widening treatment approaches will be essential to sustainable control and elimination efforts globally. 
And so as the Uniting to Combat NTDs have declared this year, 2020, as the year of NTDs by launching the End and Neglect campaign, let's all unite our voices in making history. So I'll end by acknowledging all my wonderful co-authors on this um, opinion piece, ISNTD for making this possible, and GSA for organizing my research group, and to TIBA, please do check out tibapartnership.org. Um, we're doing some wonderful work there, including COVID-19 research. And thank you from beautiful Edinburgh. A big thank you from us, Derek. That was a really fascinating, comprehensive presentation, I think, uh, for thank those um, both in schistosomiasis and also outside of that field, really putting it in context um, about the need for treatment, but also much wider partnerships and um, interventions, whether they be in WASH, community involvement, education, and so forth. So a big thank you for that. You're getting a lot of thank yous on our chat feed as well. And uh, if anyone hasn't had a chance yet, just please hop over and uh, give us some of your thoughts or questions or just say a very quick hello. Uh, we've had the pleasure of having Anne Wogu from Cameroon. Hello to join, joining us today. Arwana Frosa from Brazil, Nuruddin Rahman, Nigeria, Martin Omedo from Kenya's NTD program, and Almeida, Portugal. And I can't name everybody, but um, uh, there's, there's a big crowd out there, Derek, who are all saying thank you and a big hello to you. Um, there's been a couple questions as well, and uh, not surprisingly, one of the, the first kind of um, questions raised was um, just asking really about um, these uh, MDAs and uh, treatment rounds and the ongoing COVID situation. So what, what would happen? Um, what treatment strategy are you preparing for the preschool age group after COVID-19 is over and the WHO gives permission for the treatment of this age group to resume. The delayed and sporadic treatment will result in a large reservoir program in this age group. Right, so... Are there plans in place already? Right, um, I, I cannot exactly say what specific plans are for the, the different countries. Um, however, I, I do know that there are currently modeling studies going on to determine how long treatment programs can withstand the, the hold from COVID-19 in order to put forward strategies to be able to inform how to mitigate some of the consequences that, that come with it. And so um, I'm sure until we, we we're able to get some of these things um, the, the results from the modeling studies will, will know exactly what, what to do. However, um, it's, it, it, it is important to mention that the, the WHO, despite the recommendation, still recommends that anybody who needs treatment from NTDs should still be treated. The issue is that large community service and MDA are what has been halted. And so education and specific targeted treatment can still go on. And so I think we can still use the diagnose and treat strategy as recommended in preschool children to be able to identify some of these guys. That's a really important distinction, absolutely. Um, you've had another question, Derek, from Helena Oliartha. Uh, from the Ministry of Health Indonesia. I would just like to give a special acknowledgement to Helena and a big hello. Slamat sore. I think you've attended every single ISNTD Connect meeting, so I think that will deserve a prize in its own right when the time is right. Um, so hello again, Helena, and thanks for tuning in very regularly. Um, so Helena's saying, thank you, Derek, for the presentation. Uh, what is the prevalence in Uganda uh, only SAC distribute for MDA and less in adult population. Um, how do you distribute the dose in adults? Uh, what age is targeted for parasitology survey for baseline or evaluation? And what is the control measure for surveillance to reach elimination? So quite a few technical questions there, very detailed. Can you, can you, can you take them again one by one? Yeah, what I can do is I can does this now appear on your screen? I've broadcast the question to the right. room. Yes, yes. Okay. Lesson how you distribute those in adults. 
Yes. So for the first one, like I rightly said, the fact that endemicity depends on school age children is a problem. So as as you said in your question, um, it gives us a false idea as to how prevalent the situation is in order to to distribute treatment um, to adults. And so there's a need to be able to extend um, determining endem endemicity to the other age groups in order to administer uh, MDA. So that that is a recommendation. And Marian, can I have the, the question back? So I oh yeah, another. sorry. And Helena was saying she is herself working in schistosomiasis. So um, there we go. Age is targeted for parasitology survey for baseline evaluation. Yes, yeah, so that that usually depends only on school age children, and so they are, they are currently moves to um, either find a way to be able to extrapolate what the prevalence is in school age children to preschool age children and adults to know what what exactly the situation is. Um, again, Marian, please let me take the last one. Yep. Sorry. I keep moving away. Uh, there we go. Pardon. What is the control measure for surveillance to reach mm. elimination? Yeah, so um, like I said in the last but one slide, in order to reach elimination, we need to widen the treatment gaps, but that cannot stand alone. We need to do that alongside the uh, snail control, education, and providing adequate wash facilities. I mean, schistosomiasis is typically common in places where there's poor sanitation. So you provide that at the widening treatment gaps is the only way we can be able to achieve elimination. It, it, it We cannot do this via treatment alone. Brilliant, thank you, Derek. Um, a quick question from that wonderful presentation. There are some who say, I'll just share that. There are some who say that the under two year age group is not that much affected due to lower risk as they don't play in water bodies, et cetera, at that age. What is the evidence that you have from your research on this? Okay, so that that I'd say is a, it's a historical perspective because we've seen that it is not the same. Um, first, modeling studies and human epidemiological studies have shown that by the time children are age one, they are exposed and can be infected. There are several studies that have shown prevalence of inf infection in preschool age children. And our own studies show that when you go out in the field in endemic areas, again, like I showed you in the first picture, the exposure to infection in this age group is hugely, hugely linked with that of their caregivers. And so the mother going to fetch water that may be infected, bringing it to the home, or either going to the riverside or the stream to carry out daily chores. And whilst they do that, they put their kids in a basin of water to play around. And so that uh, prolonged exposure risks, risks them to infection. Uh, lastly, even their older siblings, when they want to you know, swim in the water, they can carry these guys along. And so there, there's so much evidence of exposure and infection in this age group. And so that, that should be a historical perspective. Excellent. Thank you, Derek. Um, another question here uh, from Joseph Kunbur. The WHO has recently recommended that treatment for schistosomiasis should be focal and based on parasite intensity as against the situation in the past where a whole district is considered as an implementation unit. In a situation where STH is co-endemic with schistosomiasis, won't this complicate program planning uh, and implementation? Yeah, but I I think the, the fact that treatment should be focal and based on parasite infection is not, it's, it's, to, it's to determine what it's, it's, it's to be able to make operational plans. And so I, I don't think this, this will necessarily complicate issues. It rather helps to be able to make operational plans because if you, if you know what the endemicity is, you know what the infection intensity is, you know what strategy to use within that endemic area. And um, 
you can plan that alongside other health in interventions that are there. But that's a good point, though, because um, there have been suggestions that in doing all of this, we always need to consider the impact of some of these programs on the other existing programs for NTDs and other infections that are, because it, it's, it creates a huge burden on health systems. And so that's, that's also another, another factor to, to bear in mind. Absolutely. And uh, in the meantime, Derek, you've had an uh, uh, offer here and a call for partnership from Ogachuku Aribodor, who's okay. saying, great presentation, and can we swap email addresses for more dis discussions? Uh, Ogachuku is working on community sustainability of MDA of medicines for Shisto and STH control in Anambra State, Nigeria. And right now, would like to try and work on the snail mapping in my state. So uh a call for a partnership there perhaps um you can keep in touch following this talk sure. Sure. um we've had another question here from daniel cohn uh, who again says thank you for the talk derek regarding the targeting of adults in a given treatment area with moderate prevalence where less uh where less than the whole adult population is targeted a challenge remains establishing an accurate population denominator. Without this, one can treat but won't know the treatment coverage. Do you have any suggestions for any techniques for establishing an accurate adult subgroup population denominator prior to MDA? And if I may remind anyone asking a question, if um, you know, if you want to introduce which organization uh, you're you're speaking from, that would be very well. Per personally, I don't, I don't have any any suggestions re with regards to that. Um, but yeah, it's a good question and food, food for thought. Well, if uh, anyone I don't in know if, if anyone has yeah. has a suggestion with regards to that, yeah, it would be nice to to share. If you're feeling brave, um, to those in the uh, audience, you have a little um, icon which is a raised hand, and that is a request to speak. So. Um, now, if you if you don't mind, then we could actually bring you into the discussions. Uh, fingers crossed, technology allow being on our side. So, if anyone has any comments or would like to add to any of the discussions, please don't hesitate. Oh, here we go. We have a very brave soul. Um, oh no, you you've changed your mind. Okay, not to worry. <laughs> um, perhaps later. Um, Great question here uh, from Martin Omedo and uh, something we you, well, you touched upon. Sorry, uh, sorry Marianne, someone, Cosmas, says they yeah. can contribute to that. Go for it. Yeah. On. Uh, is that okay? Oh, yes, Cosmas, I can contribute to that. Yeah. All right. Okay. Joseph Kunbor as well has requested to speak. So Joseph, um, if you're ready for it, I will, no, nope, you've also changed your mind. Not to worry, everyone. It's not as scary as it may seem. <laughs> and, um, oh, well, I've just seen that Daniel was saying, um, he, that Daniel's speaking in from FHI 360, part of USAID's Act to End NTDs program. So thank you for that. Uh, so back to the question I'd spotted from Martin Amado, right. uh, which uh, is here. Oh, okay. Cosmos, Cosmos has joined the room. Hi, Cosmos. Hi. How are you doing? Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Canada. Brilliant. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, Derek, and thanks very much Hi. for your very, very eloquent uh, presentation. Thank you. It really touched those key areas that are really challenging for elimination. And with regards to the last question that was asked, uh, what's the experience with um, determining a denominator to estimate coverage within adults? Right. So, um, first of all, you need to know exactly um, what your uh, at risk population is looking at your catchment area and that's really going to change with the new who um sub district optimization strategy that is currently being recommended but once you know exactly your school age population depending on the country um 
census data, whether it's 25%, 30%. From that um, population, you can now know exactly which age group is beyond 15 years. So if school age is defined in your country as five to 14, and the national statistics shows that it's 25 or 28 percent of uh, that population, then you know automatically that the other 75 will be the adult um, age group that you'll need to target. So that's the experience we've had in Guinea, um, where we are operating uh, more or less like a hybrid platform, treating kids in school and also adults in the communities. So. Uh, that has really helped us to improve on our coverage because we realized that um, after six months um, within the MDA, um, you just get reinfections, outbreak of hematuria, and we realized that the adults were really posing a very huge risk to, to the kids and the community entirely. So we started treating adults two years ago. And we have seen a huge decrease in terms of uh, morbidity, hematuria in communities that's really reduced significantly. Um, yeah. Thank Brilliant. you. Thank you. And with regards to the STH and Shisto and sub-district targeting, um, I think it's a challenge now because we are still waiting for the new WHO guidelines that are still to come. Um, that was promised last year. Um, this has to also do with the mapping, how mapping will be structured, because Shisto is more or less systematically um, um, targeted with STH in most countries, depending mm. and mapping is done same way, implementation is done same way. So we just separate uh, depending on what the outcome of your mapping results. So for the SDH, it will still remain at district level. So that doesn't alter how you deliver your SDH result. The sub-district optimization doesn't alter how you will deliver your SDH result. Right. But it will be very challenging when you want to conduct coverage evaluation surveys. How do you differentiate your target population knowing that you are treating um, sub district for Shisto and treated entire health districts for SDH. How to power your survey and also op operationalize your coverage evaluation surveys will become a very huge challenge. And that's something that um, we need to get more clarity from uh, WHO Spain and also others who will be who are working in the Shisto world. Um, coming together, sharing ideas uh, going forward will be very helpful to us. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Cosmas. Um, that's really broadened the discussion. And uh, in fact, I think building on that, we have uh, Professor Poppy Lamberton from the University of Glasgow, who is going to also come in and join us. Oh, Poppy Lamberton has joined the room. Hello, Poppy. Oh, hello. Yes. Oh, hi. We can hear you. Hi. Yeah, this is Poppy Lamerton hi. from the University of Glasgow. Um, just to follow up on that, actually, so I'd um, clicked request to speak before the previous speaker was talking, but um, um, just to follow on. So firstly, the question was, was focused quite correctly on moderate, but to put that in context for people who might not understand. So in high end domestic areas, it is all adults are considered at risk in these really high endemistic areas. So then the denominator mm -hmm. is the is the population um, in that area. But but quite correctly, it's saying if, with the moderate areas where it's at risk adults and what that at risk means makes it much harder. Now we have got sort of data from historically very old data, pre MDA and stuff. But one of the really important things I think will be to make use of the micro mapping. So talking about those focal points and at the moment areas that might be as a large district or large area be designated as moderate when you perform micro mapping that might already tease out certain populations where actually these these smaller areas require all of the adults to be to be treated and other small areas we don't require the adults to be treated. But in the areas where we're still unsure, I think it is important that um, community wide surveys are taken at sort of like stratified samples and villages across different com um, community across different countries to understand now in the sort of during and post MDA era what the age infection profiles are 
So historically, the school-aged children were really targeted because those were the people with some of the highest infection intensities in these high intensity areas. But actually, as repeated treatments happen in these school-aged children, that sort of shifts slightly. And now they're not necessarily the highest because they've had multiple treatments. But the people, when they leave school, like the 15-year-olds and plus, are the really kind of heavily infected areas, as, as we know. Um, and so what might be needed is con uh, community-wide mapping, but also surveys, including behavior surveys, age, gender, occupation, to now know, again, in the, in the continuous MDA era, which are the populations of those adults that are really at risk. So it's one of the most evident ones is fisher folk, but there are different communities which, which might be teased out from some, some really focal surveys that then could be extrapolated up further. And I guess as we move towards elimination, it's more important to include people who might not necessarily be needed in that group rather than to miss out key groups. But it is Absolutely. a very difficult thing to, <laughs> to survey. And obviously there's lots of different variations across countries and things, but it's, yeah, moving forwards, we do need more data. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you for that, Poppy. Thanks, and Poppy. Anouk Gouvras from the Global Schistosomiasis um, Alliance has also been posting uh, in the chat the, quite a few resources, um, including for those interested in the WHO SPEN MDA optimization tool, uh, there's a link there on the eliminateschisto.org website, as well as a lot of other um, tools and resources. So please also don't hesitate to hop over to that. Um, thank you very much, Poppy, in any case. Um, we did have a question from Martin Omedo, who works with Apt Associate, a consortium partner in the DFID Ascend program. And uh, Martin, you wanted to um, discuss a little bit and expand the, the chat to um, the issue of WASH and partnering with WASH. Um, currently, most of the funding for WASH is very lurking or sparse, and we know WASH in itself is a very complex intervention if we are to take it on comprehensively. Um, so to yourself, Derek, and also our attendees and um, the uh, Poppy and Cosmos who've kindly on, jumped on into the discussion, um, how would you recommend we approach this from an NTD perspective? And I suppose part of this question could also be extended to the um, snail control aspect. So what would be the best way on a funding level, on a programmatic level, to strengthen those and coordinate those interventions. You you want me to come in, Maya? Go on, Derek. <laughs> You're the star of the show, so. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, per personally, with regards to WASH, I feel like you rightly said, um, funding is really inadequate, um, whereas you, you would realize that in most most of these areas, um, rather increasing or improving WASH activities and mod modeling studies have been shown that will greatly reduce the risk because it's some of the problems we have with WASH that are coming with the human behavior that is putting people at risk for some of these things. So um, yeah, I mean, I guess it's a, uh, it's, it's, it seems to be a great area that needs much, much more attention than is currently being given. Um, I believe one, if you give the people a reason not to, you know, come in contact with infective water whilst you take care of the other interventions like the snow control, um, our elimination strategies will, will be much, much better. Um, Poppy, anything? only turned my video on rather than my mic first of all but there's it's fine <laughs> um uh no i was uh, agreeing um with you derek that it is it's it's really important to work together um i think one of the key aspects with wash is that um firstly we really need to improve include social scientists anthropologists and you know it's not as simple as putting in wash facilities because trying to actually have uptake is one of the most important things and it's Sometimes it, it's, it's not just, you know, that, that they won't, don't want people, obviously mostly don't just not want to use latrines, they don't want to use them for a reason because the holes are too big for their children, it's too dangerous, or they haven't got shoes and it's dirty. So there's a real kind of complex situation going on there. But also I think the Shisto community in particular 
um, could work very well with the WASH community, but but by saying what what can we add on? Because actually, for pe these communities, sanitation is a huge problem, but it's it's a more sort of urgent problem with diarrheal diseases and things like that for their children. And so, tapping into that reservoir and working with them rather than trying to work alone would, I think, have much greater benefit. Because it, yes, just as much is a huge problem in these communities, but for the vast majority of the people, it's not their primary concern. And and it's sort of trying to say, well, actually. If we all work together, the benefit of sanitation is is huge. Um, and obviously, the one thing with Shisto is that that it's not you can use a latrine all the time, but if you go in the water, you can get infected, or vice versa, you can never go in the water and not use latrines. So it, it's it's a it's a much more complex interaction. But I do think that we um, need to sort of approach the wash community and say what what added value can we give, but but mostly where you know where can you help us? Yeah. Yeah, and and also um, just just a quick point, I I I think I've realized that for most endemic countries, the cultural context is different, and so again, in implementing a lot of these wash activities, we need to um, do it within the cultural context and the practices of the people for it to make more sense and be more practical and useful um, for what their lifestyles are and what their daily activities are. Absolutely. And um, I think I've mentioned this before during uh, some of the Connect series, but uh, here at ISNTD, we actually teamed up with a, a group of actors and um, kind of using theatre based skills to uh, understand a bit better from the communities themselves what those priorities are. And um, there's a website called actingforhealth.org. In fact, um, there was some work there done with Poppy's group. So good memories there. <laughs> And uh, that, you know, watch this space. I think it, it will be interesting to to see what novel approaches can can yield there. Um, I'm just a few minutes, a few seconds behind on the chat, but I just wanted to read out a comment from uh, Anna Kildemose, who just wanted to chime in in agreement with Poppy, advocating for micromapping and attention on focality of schistosomiasis. We absolutely all... Everyone okay? Yep. Um, we absolutely also need to include focus on improved and expanded diagnostic tools to meet elimination context challenges. So just to kind of support and reiterate what um, Poppy was um, saying there. Uh, I Perhaps we could move on to a question uh, from Sergio Lopez. Hello, Sergio. Um, speaking from the Mentor Initiative and supporting MDA in Angola. Uh, thanks for the great talk. One of the challenges on the treatment gaps we are finding are non-enrolled school-aged children. Do you have any suggestions on how to ensure that these are treated as well? Um, community MDA would be ideal, but is currently unfeasible in Angola. Thanks. Personally, um, I'll, I'll just use my experience from our work in Zimbabwe, is that one very useful tool you can utilize is the village health workers or the community health workers. These are people within the communities who work with them, the people can trust them. And so these people usually before you have MDAs can be able to mobilize all, all guardians to bring their, their wards to the various treatment centers, including non-enrolled um, school children. They, they, they know where the people live, they are with them and so they can always inform them of what is going on for them to bring their awards over to participate in mdas and i think it's it's been a very good um, strategy uh, i can share our, our experience with that cosmos talking um mm -hmm. yes we we realized when we started our to work that uh, our coverage was very low amongst non-enrolled kids and we decided to operate a um, hybrid platform where we're treating both in school and in the community systematically. Um, that we learned from the immunization program how important it is to tag the children, um, mark their index finger to differentiate between kids that are treated in school or kids that have received um, Prezoquantel um, during the day. So. Um, your targeting has to be very clear in terms of knowing exactly 
which population is within um, the school age uh, that enrolled and which population is out of school. So when you have a good micro mapping of your uh, school map and you are able to identify your, your enrolled kids from your target, your annual treatment target, you can now be able to kind of project how many kids will be expected to be treated in the community. And the school, the um, community distributors, the CDDs, they are the ones that we use to deliver MDA to um, the non-enrolled, where the teachers will stay in school and then um, treat for um, the enrolled kids. So that's how we're able to close that um, gap and we've seen over time when conducting coverage evaluation service that the coverage between school um, enrolled and non-enrolled kids have really increased and almost neck to neck in our um, assessment. Brilliant, okay. And again, if um, you know for anybody who wants to have more information on the uh, toolkit for WASH and NTDs working together, uh, other WASH tools, um, just please head over to eliminateshisto.org. The complete link is over on your right hand side on the chat or I think below us if you're on your mobile phone. Um, so just broadening a little bit this WASH conversation, uh, John Gibb here is asking why are investment levels so low in Watson in the endemic countries and that's kind of a completely, uh, you know, a whole new topic separate from specifically schisto control. But um, who should be pushing the authorities on this? So is this, you know, something for the health sector to look at? Is this something for the um, urban planners to do? Um, you know, based on your experience, where do you think this could effectively come from? I, I think I on that i agree with poppy um with regards to involving everybody because that that aspect that doesn't just rest on the science it rests on both the science and the social science and every other thing involved and you know comes with after uniting to tackle and shed more light on that problem and it probably will draw more 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 funders and investments in that area and Probably more scientists should start um, um, d delving into those those aspects of research. Uh, I don't know if anyone has something else to add. Yes, um, it, it will require a lot of advocacy to policymakers, um, and also, as you rightly said, build synergy in, in country to um, have that kind of strong voice and see where because most of our interventions are uh, behavior change focus, health education, sensitization, but uh, we don't invest in infrastructure. So presenting the case to the policymakers, um, local governments, and also ministries responsible for urbanization, they are the ones that really have to pick up this and you know, put it in policy and see how schools and health facilities could be provided with um, water and sanitation facilities that would significantly reduce um, infection levels. If you go to some of the schools where our experience has been that, the sanitation conditions in schools are very, very poor, and also at times in health facilities. So um, at our level, it's hard to make significant investment in um, wash infrastructure. But we have a good case to present to policymakers and keep pushing for them to see the need to invest directly as part of their own responsibility or what they're bringing on the table to foster um, schisto elimination. Thank you. Um, Derek, we, we, we've gone a little bit over the one hour mark. However, there, there does remain one question left. So okay. would you have a few minutes to, to take this one? Yeah, sure. Uh, it's a question from Joseph Kunbur from CBM Nigeria, and who's asking, what are the prospects of triple drug administration with Praziquantel and other PCT NTDs? There are prospects. However, pers personally with 
Prosequanto, I think there's still a need for several other studies regarding the pharmacokinetics and what the drug-drug interactions are, um, more so even in preschool age children, if we, we want to include all of these. Um, it's, it's, it's an area where we need to look more into to be sure that administering Prosequanto along with, say, albendazole or any other um, drug will not affect the efficacy or otherwise of a, um, w one of them. And so it's, it's um, more or less yes, yes and no for me. Uh, once we have more concrete evidence that, okay, this is exactly what the pharmacokinetics is and that administering it with these specific drugs will, will be okay, then we, we can do that synergistic form of Brilliant. Yeah. Um, great. Okay. Well, you know, perhaps um, as a kind of uh, conclusion to all this, so this year sees a lot of movement in NTDs and particularly the WHO's updated a new 2030 roadmap. And this is all really about strengthening health systems. So going right across diseases and um, approaching all this as, as a holistic um effort and therefore i was just wondering you know to, to round off what would you what would you like to see what in an ideal world what sort of partnerships or what what would you like to see what does the future hold uh in the best of cases for schistosomiasis control over the next kind of decade or at least the medium term well <clears throat> hmm, tricky i think <laughs> <laughs> i think we uh, based on past experiences, especially from the old roadmap, like you mentioned, to the new roadmap, and the fact that despite great efforts and great feats that we've achieved, um, a lot more needs to be done. And what we need to be doing is, like I, I discussed in the talk, identify some of the key areas that are um, resulting in some of these um, more or less slowed progress towards achieving these these NTD goals put all together and heighten research knowledge gaps practice gaps in 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 order to help achieve some of some of these aims mm -hmm. so hopefully one i think pediatric prosequanto game changer we, we we hope that that comes and to force soon we need more donated tablets mac if they're listening, plenty, plenty more. Uh, wash facilities, you know, provide that water, uh, and good sanitation, and yeah. Excellent. Poppy, did you want to add uh, anything to that? I, I think that summarised very nicely there. Um, you know, it is absolutely a team effort, and uh, it's really working together because lots of people have got lots of things to bring to the table. And, and we want to make sure that people aren't repeating things or that they're getting the, the most sort of maximum output for um, combined input. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a, it's a long haul. Um, people who set early targets, I think, were optimistic, but these are being realised and it's now becoming more realistic. But I think we, we are getting there and, uh, and bringing in the WASH partners will be absolutely key to control and elimination in the future. And, and um, Emmanuel Agunloye on the chat has just uh, posted a comment, but within that he is uh, mentioning the miracle of the guinea worm. So hopefully this will happen for schistosomiasis as well. Um, and so we will watch this space. Derek, I think you've you know timed it well to finish your PhD after lockdown, so you'll be able to celebrate properly at least. Uh, and we look forward to that day and to, you know, hearing a lot more about your research and your conclusions and what the future sure. of Dysomysis control. So just to finish off, I'd like to, um, I'm sure everybody's joining me in thanking you very much for this overview and all these insights. Uh, thank you to Poppy as well, who very bravely joined in uh, with camera on. 
and can't work out how to leave the room so i'm still here sorry (laughs) it's a pleasure um and also cosmos thank you so much you you know you you were very brave to come on board request to speak um so thank you to everyone thanks to all the great comments and um particularly uh, the global schistosomiasis alliance who um helped put the session together as well and uh you know finally just um a big goodbye if you would like to review any part of this presentation uh, later on or share it with your colleagues and your networks this will be available on our youtube channel so feel free to jump over there and to subscribe if you'd like to and uh, there's also a lot of the past icentd connects webinars so from fungal disease to um r d for for neglected diseases all sorts of topics um, being covered there uh, and so on that note, Derek, I'd like to finally thank you very much. Uh, good luck good with up. the rest of lockdown. Yeah. And uh, to everyone who participated today, stay safe and keep well. Uh, you don't need any reminding, but last connect was about hand washing. So, you know, keep washing your hands and keep looking after yourselves. And I hope um, to see you all very soon and uh, hopefully as soon as next Tuesday for our next meeting. So a very big thank you and see you all really soon. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, Poppy. Thank you, Marianne. Yeah, and thanks to all the attendees. Thanks to all who contributed. All the best. Bye-bye. Thanks, Derek.